am Andrea Butcher, and this is Being at Work. Being a leader is hard. So on this show, I set out to talk with experienced leaders to learn from their pivotal moments, how they led through the challenges we can all relate to but are often unheard. Today, I'm joined by Richard Cardwell, Vice President and Head of Midwest Region for Infosys, a global leader in next generation digital services and consulting. Richard represents 3,200 people while growing a tech hub and scaling an operation. I was in an event recently in which Richard shared a very touching story that highlighted the impact of simply taking the time to listen to someone's story. He models ultimate transparency, and we'll talk about the value in owning your own story and finding your five. Take a listen. In my current role, I lead an organization of about 3,200 people um, that report up through my structure. At the same time, I'm simultaneously trying to scale an operations here in Indianapolis where we've grown to 500 people today, uh, and our goal is to get to 3,000 people uh, within the next four or five years. Um, And as far back as I could remember, I've always just wanted to be a leader. So the job that I have today, the role that I play, is sort of exactly what I've been trying to architect, you know, throughout my career. And it really starts back with, with a story. When I, I joined a major insurance company, it was day one orientation. I'm under 25 years old, right out of college. And they handed me a sheet of paper that showed all the leadership in the organization from CEO down to vice presidents. And I said to myself, one of these days I'm going to be on that page but I'm going to be younger than they are when I do it. Uh, And through the course of my career, um, there's been some twists, turns, ups and downs. The first chapter of that, if you will, sort of the first decade was really, how do I get the metrics? You know, how do I uh, accomplish the goals? What's the next step? You know, what's required of someone at, at that next level in terms of promotion? And through that process, sort of ignored the, the sort of human element behind that. And it wasn't until I've had some personal setbacks, whether they personally or in professional life, that really made me stop and think about, you know, how do I add um, that sort of human element to my leadership style uh, in, in terms of having empathy and sympathy and finding different motivational tools to really build out, um, you know, high performing teams. And so that's essentially, you know, through working for various organizations and looking ahead and say, hey, how can I make not just the organization better, but our teams better? And ultimately, for the people who work for me, how do they become better human beings? So what does that look like in your leadership? Um, For me, you know, when when I first became uh, a manager, it, it was 13 people at that time that were on the team. And every year we go through these corporate surveys. And as I read through the surveys, the results just, I felt didn't help me. It didn't really point me into the right direction of what makes an individual employee tick, what motivates them and how do they emotionally connect to their job. So I did some research because I personally think these corporate surveys have sort of been watered down. They're very generalized and have become really nonsense and unusable. And so I look for very personal questions that were about seven to 12 total, you know, and and an example of, do you have a best friend at work? Have you been complimented in the last seven days? Um, When's the last time you and your manager sat down and talked about your performance? So it really looked at these time-based interactions and it was more focused on individual employee answers rather than sort of these collective responses. Mm -hmm. And as a result, um, what I started to notice is that, you know, the strengths and weaknesses of an individual at their workplace invariably translates to the same in their personal life because all of them would share their personal story. And so it sort of clicked in me that if I can figure out how to motivate them relative to, you know, their needs and how do I help improve their performance, you know, in the workplace, that invariably will translate them into becoming better human beings because they'll apply the same tools in their personal life. That is where the reward is for me. And so that's what I keep in front of me now is, you know, that connecting point that understand that they're just not employees. They're just not subordinates, if you will. 
they're, they're also human beings. Being at work. Yeah. The humans are showing up with all of their strengths and weaknesses. So Richard, give us an example of a team member and, you know, how you played out this idea of, I want to make you a better human being. Any, anyone particular come to mind? Yeah. So there's an individual in the, in the process of trying to scale a business locally and doing it organically. Invariably, you're going to find all kinds of personalities. Mm-hmm. And we recruited people from all over the United States with various backgrounds. Um, and so you have to take each person as they come and figure out how they can translate into this new environment, how they become a part of the culture. And in particular, we hired an individual right out of college, went through some very intensive training. And I think the stress, the anxiety of moving from his hometown away from his family into a brand new city, brand new job, it started to express, you know, his anxiety through cutting his arms. So he sort of had this condition where just to relieve the anxiety, he would, he would cut on his forearms. And the team members in his training class sort of recognized this becoming a trend. And they reached out to our human resources department and me as well, just to notify us that this trend is happening. And it's obviously disruptive to the workplace. People are concerned. It's a distraction. So we sat down and had a really a one-on-one conversation with him just to understand like what's happening and what we can do to help you. And he started sharing that, you know, he came from, you know, a broken home. Uh, It's very dysfunctional. He's the first person in his family to graduate from college and he is just having a hard time acclimating. So very similar background to myself. So I'm the first person in my family to go to university at a period of time when I was in sixth grade, I was homeless myself. My parents were divorced. Uh, They abused alcohol and drugs. And, you know, my mom was in jail for something. Dad was gone, had no apartment or home to go to. So slept in the car and uh, would shower in the gym before school started each day. And so I shared that story. And I think at my level, uh, people assume you got there because you worked hard. You came from a good family. And you didn't have a lot of major setbacks in your life. And so when I started to share that story in in that, look, we understand what you're going through. I can personally relate to it. You shouldn't be ashamed of of your background. In fact, you really need to own that's who you are. And that's a part of part of your story. And you need to put that in front of people. So that way you own the narrative and not them. And the, the, the conversation really ended with, I want you to be here and I want you to know that you're cared for and we want you to be a part of the team. Happy to say since, since that conversation, and I'm sure he's received some help. We haven't seen any evidence of Mm. of that. And so knowing and being aware that he doesn't necessarily have a solid support system outside of the workplace, we invariably by default have become that support system for him. So we've become the consistent voice. You know, we have become the mentor uh, and have really embraced, you know, his strengths, his weaknesses, uh, and are willing to, to kind of continue giving him a chance and molding him. And, you know, there's a tremendous amount of pride. I think we have in that is because it wasn't about his ability to code, right? It was about, it was about his ability, you know, to be happy in a, in a healthy human being. Wow. <clears throat> well, you were certainly vulnerable with him in that moment by sharing your story up until that point, Richard, had you shared that story with, with employees and team members? You know, I selectively do it, you know, because you kind of have to, with something that heavy, that much weight to it, you you sort of have to pick your spots. Mm -hmm. You know, I wove it into a conversation or in a certain context to say, look, listen, you know, the, the challenges you might face as a human being, in the workplace, whether you're going through some financial struggles, you're going through a divorce, you know, your inability to, let's say, make your mortgage payment, that, you know, there are individuals out there who can understand that. They've, you know, stepped in your shoes. Mm-hmm. I, I provide exa- other examples in my life of, you know, how I've overcome certain obstacles and, and really have stressed the fact that, you know, all of us need multiple mentors in our life and sometimes mm-hmm. simultaneously, like at once because of these experiences, this working narrative that I've been trying to weave into my leadership style is this concept of called finding your five, meaning 
the five is what five people can you surround yourself with that will help you? Whether it be mentoring from a work perspective, whether it be something to do with religion or spirituality, whether it be something to do with helping you understand, you know, your own and personal emotions, you know, um, and how you develop as a human being, helping you with your personal finances, maybe becoming a motivator in terms of getting into the gym, being healthy. And most people have one or two best friends when they're, when they're an adult, but you know, we don't, we should not, Mm -hmm. you know, take that for granted where we load them up with all of our issues and then spend hours on the phone trying to rehash them. (laughs) Right. So you, you need to diffuse that and you got to look for people who sort of could be your many experts in, you know, various fields. So I have somebody that mentors me from a work perspective. I have somebody that gives me grace on a continual basis. And I have someone else that has helped me with my religion and spirituality. And I've had others that helped me with, you know, I have a best friend that that's in St. Louis and, you know, he's the person I can tell uh, anything to the truth without any judgment. And so I know where to go when I have certain needs. And if I don't have a fifth person or, you know, a missing two, I go out and actually seek, seek those individuals mm-hmm. out. Well, it sounds like that's what you were providing for this team member. When, you know, when, when you said to him, I want you here and I want you to know you're cared for, like that's what your five does for you. Right. right? They, they remind you that, Hey, we got you in this. Yeah. I can't be so selfish that I need the five people to help me. Right. I have to be aware that I need to become somebody's yeah. one of five to help them in their career. Yeah. I also think Richard, I'm just putting myself in, in this team member's shoes. And so here is this executive who, you know, assumptions probably are, he's got it all together. This guy leading thousands of people and in his nice suit jacket. So you sharing with him something so personal also told him like, you're not alone, that what you're feeling is normal and right. you, you can persevere through this. Right. And, and so that's the other, the other sort of leadership lesson that I've learned, especially in this role now, is we're, we're doing something in the organization that we've really never done before. We don't have all the answers figured out and we're going to make mistakes. And in that process of growing to 3000 people, there are going to be frustrations and bumps in the road and some confusion. And I thought, you know, what better way to lead than through ultimate transparency? It is okay for me to be vulnerable as a leader to say, I don't have the answer, Mm. but my job is to obviously figure it out and solve it. And so that a, again, that vulnerability that I have, I can't pretend to know all the answers. Um, putting that narrative out in front and owning it. No one else can sort of take control of that. And at the end of the day, if the people I'm leading know that I'm being authentic and transparent, Mm -hmm. the trust value in that Mm -hmm. is immediate. Mm -hmm. And so they're willing to follow me through uncharted waters or unknown territory, Mm -hmm. uh, knowing that I have their back. Mm -hmm. Yes. And they feel cared for in the process. Right. 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 So it's definitely this feeling of you're in this together. Yep. Ultimate transparency. How, um, how as a leader, how have you learned that? Is when, when is there a pivotal moment in your career when you recognize the importance of that? Yeah. So when, when at various stages, when a company is going through transformation, you know, I, I wasn't, I have a consulting background and, we would stand up in front of multiple different clients and say, here's how you need to transform and be a part of the communication journey and to say, listen, we're going to close these particular offices. We're going to lay off this amount of people, or we're going to develop these new products and services and we need to retrain everyone. You see a lot of corporate speak, Mm -hmm. you know, and companies don't say, Hey, we're going to go ahead and cut 1500 people from our San Antonio office starting next month because we need to save money. How clear have you seen any corporate communication be than that? It doesn't happen. No. It's a bunch of language around business metrics and you know competition, how the industries are getting disrupted. And as a result, we're going to be making these decisions over this amount of time frame. And so all your employees are left to guess, am I getting laid off? Am I getting fired? 
what do I need to do to change with the organization? And I've seen so many examples of that. As much change as we're experiencing now as a company, how do you hold on to those various narratives? Because mm-hmm. they start to become not the truth. And so I felt no matter what the truth is, lead with it. Even if it even if it's to your own detriment, even if there's a bump in, in the metric downward uh, or disruption to your business, in the long run, there's, you know, faith and trust mm-hmm. and belief, mm-hmm. I think, are stronger than whatever particular bottom line we're well, trying to change. And it's real. And don't you think people can feel that? And when you argue with reality, you will lose 100% of the time. So we might as well acknowledge this is what's going on. Right. And, and I think what, what also happens is they personalize that as well to say, okay, I understand where we are. Thank you for telling me the truth. Yeah. Now, what do I need to what do What can to help? I do? Right. Yeah. So it creates a charge. Like, Correct. okay, because I am in this. This is, this is what I'm a part of. Yeah. What, what can I do to help solve it? Right. Yeah. But we sugarcoat. We pretend. I mean, I can think of lots of times in my career when I've done that because that's the easier thing to do. And I, I think we have to give people more credit for their emotional IQ than what we do. You know, we're, we're, that's sort of the thing we're not talking about the most is the ability to have a high emotional IQ. And that comes both ways in terms of a leader. If you know you're going to give some information that's upsetting, you have to allow your people to be frustrated. You have to say, okay, let's go into this room. And if you need to cuss up and down the wall, go ahead. Mm-hmm. That's okay. I understand how you're feeling. And then once they sort of get through that phase, okay, well, let's have a much more rational conversation. Yeah. But you have to be aware and give people sort of that space to be able to flex and bend their emotions Mm -hmm. based on the reality and not necessarily judge them for it. How do you balance that with solution moving forward? That's something I struggle with a lot throughout my career, just being a naturally positive, can-do person. I want to very quickly jump to that. I get the, you've got to allow people to feel what they're feeling. But at what point do you say, okay, now we've got to move on? Well, then it becomes a, a discussion more around, you know, I, I'm very much a proponent of let my people lead. So let's sit in a room and have a conversation about what do we all collectively do next, mm-hmm. right? Let's generate some ideas, some solutions, and let's agree to certain fundamental principles of how we're going to operate moving forward. Okay, so you can feel frustrated and at the same time, ask ourselves, what can we do? Right. Like those things can coexist. And, it, and I, the, I cap that kind of, that kind of conversation off with, I can't be everywhere at once. So individual team members have to hold one another accountable. Mm-hmm. Right. And if you see something that's disruptive to your culture, you see something that's disruptive to a particular outcome, you have to speak up. You have to collectively as a team help modify their behavior. So that way it's in line with, what the organization is trying to achieve. Mm-hmm. Okay. So ultimate transparency is a theme through all of this. Going back to the story that you started with the, um, the individual who having some real challenges, you sat down with him, you shared your own story. How have, how have you uh, encouraged team members, Richard, to, to do that, to share their story, to own it, like what, is, what does that look like for you? This is where I probably have to give credit to my under, undergraduate degree in psychology because <laughs> I've learned a lot of um, active listening principles and, and concepts. And I think that's really what it's take, taken you know, to sort of achieve that is uh, tremendous active listening and, and applying those techniques and really asking open-ended questions and, and not being afraid to sort of deep dive into certain subject matters that maybe I feel uncomfortable with, but it's part of their narrative, part of their story, and I need to be willing to listen. And so that's, you know, I've had to lean back on some of, you know, what I've learned over time, but also what I've learned academically in terms of being able to apply it. And so recognizing in that moment, okay, this is a bit painful, but I got to stay here right now. Right. It's being present um, and, you know, doing all the things that are necessary to make, make sure the folks that you're leading feel validated and valuable at the same time. Yeah. So how do you do that when you have 3,200 people in your care? Right, right. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a lot. Um, the, the one thing is accessibility. 
So we go through, you know, new hire orientation twice a week in our Indianapolis office. And and we have brand new batches of undergraduate hires as well, sometimes upwards of 50 that are sitting in a classroom. And on my email at work is my personal cell phone number. I don't use a corporate phone. Mm -hmm. I don't have any other way of contacting me other than through that phone. And so, you know, my pledge to them is, write this number down. These are the hours I can be available for you. You reach out to me directly because I'm personally committed to our success. Do they use the number? And they use the number. Mm-hmm. So they know um, when to call. They, they, there's certain family time, you know, that I carve out on sure. the weekends that, that I'm well, you've not set reachable. Some bound- you've set some boundaries. Yeah, you have to. But from someone who started two days with the company, you know, back to my insurance example, when I started with that company and I saw the list of vice presidents and senior vice presidents, never in my mind did I think it's okay to reach out to them. And in fact, for a number of years, I was never even in the same room with them. And You didn't know them. Yeah, didn't know them. You and, didn't know that they cared. Right. Because we're, we were a big organization and they had a lot of responsibility. And I'm not a person that really lets that stop me. So anyone, if it's two days into the firm, if it's 20 years into the firm, I'm accessible. And I'm willing to take the time and solve whatever the employee issue might be. And, and so that's a little bit reactive of approach. But the proactive is, you know, we go on client visits. We go visit and have these town halls where I have these very transparent discussions. And I understand an hour long town hall might actually mean three hours of my time because there's going to be two hours of people lined up in a queue ready to ask these questions. You have to be patient and and work through it. And I think once you do that groundwork and people know that you're accessible, they then start to govern themselves on what should be a priority for me to reach out to Rick mm. for, you know, Richard for or not. Yeah, because the most important thing is them knowing that you are important to me. You're important enough that I'm going to give you my cell phone number. Right. Like, isn't that the first step? Right. That yeah. sends a clear message. Yep. That's great. There's uh, so many takeaways from our conversation. I think I think the overarching theme, ultimate transparency and owning your story. So that is clearly something you've learned throughout your career. And you're now encouraging your team members to do the same. By being accessible, providing your cell phone number, you're giving them an opportunity to reach out and ask for help when they need it. Right. So I think it's, it, it's about you know, me being, having that mindset of finding your five. Yeah. Right. And when I'm having those conversations with employees, I ask those questions. Who are the five people in your life helping you? And if you don't have five, we're going to sit into the room until you identify them. And then I, a week later will say, did you reach out to them? What's Mm -hmm. going on? And it's not about their work product at that point. Right. It's about, you know, them knowing that they have value as a person that, mm-hmm. you know, them recognizing, yes, I have some improvements to, but you just can't sit, mm-hmm. right. You can't sit idle. You have to continue to work on yourself, obviously. And if that benefits us as an organization in the long run, great. If they decide that they've grown out of their role or if they matured out of the role because of these, you know, extra strengths that they've gathered and they decide to go somewhere else and be productive, What's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? Yeah, you're you're bettering them right. and all of the people in their lives. So the ripple effects of that right. yeah. are, are very great. Thank you for your example and what you're doing at Emphasis. And thanks to the organization for what they're doing for the community. Yeah, it's it's a it's been a fantastic journey. There's there's lots of work to do in the years to come, but we're making a big impact and you know it's a uh, as a lifelong Hoosier, it's a very proud moment for yeah. me. Yeah, when well, you're making a personal impact too, right, on the lives of all of your employees. Yeah. It's it's um it's good that you see that. You know, I appreciate the kind words. Mm-hmm. If our listeners want to connect with you, Richard, what's the best way to do that? A couple of ways. One, um, very active on LinkedIn, uh, Richard Cardwell, and on Twitter, I am at Digital Rick C. Okay. Yeah. Well, thanks for being here. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you for joining us for this episode. Please subscribe wherever you listen to your podcast to never miss a being at work story.